Hello everyone, welcome to the JW Review. My name is Mike Felker and we are finishing up section one of the Enjoy Life Forever publication uh, and this is study article number 12 titled, What Will Help You to Keep Studying the Bible? So uh, last week's uh, lesson really does tie into this one. If you didn't watch last week's or the last uh, uh, study session, uh, please go check that out because we talk a lot about how uh, to study the Bible and how uh, studying the Bible in the non-Jehovah's Witness world of Christianity is very, very different from how Jehovah's Witnesses uh, study the Bible. And as far as um, what will help you to keep studying the Bible in terms of uh, motivation, um, that is also uh, very different in the world of Jehovah's Witnesses versus uh, the rest of uh, Christianity. Okay, so let's go ahead and dig into this. And the first point is why is Bible study valuable? Why is Bible study valuable? The Word of God is active. I'm sorry, the Word of God is alive and exerts power. I said active because uh, when I read it from the Legacy Standard Bible, it says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and being able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All right, so continuing on, the Bible is valuable because it reveals God's thoughts and his feelings toward you. It helps you to gain not only knowledge, but also true wisdom and hope. True wisdom and hope. Uh, most important, the Bible helps you to become Jehovah's friend. When you study the Bible, you allow its power to have a positive effect on your life. All right, so this whole idea of, about knowledge and wisdom, we're going to pick that up in, um, in the second point. But what I want to highlight and focus on here is that the Bible helps you to become Jehovah's friend. Now, we did an entire lesson review on uh, what friendship with Jehovah means, and that's something that studied uh, very early on. I don't remember what lesson that was, but it was a couple of lessons ago. It's a very, very important lesson to, uh, to check out. So if you haven't checked that one out, please, please, please do, because the whole idea of being Jehovah's friend is a regular theme uh, amongst uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. You're gonna see that all over the place, um, but just to kind of reiterate the point, the whole idea of being a friend of God is for those with an earthly hope, not for those with a heavenly hope, who Jehovah's Witnesses call the anointed class of 144,000. Those ones get, get to be adopted sons of God, right? But if you're not one of those anointed who are going to rule and reign with Christ in heaven, you get to be Jehovah's friend. Uh, the problem with that is that is actually not a Christian viewpoint. The whole idea of uh, being a friend of God, yeah, that's cited in James and speaking of Abraham, and Abraham became a friend of God. Um, that's an old covenant concept. You won't find anything in the Bible after Pentecost uh, where it speaks of Christians being friends of God. It's just simply not there. This is something that the Watchtower has created to differentiate uh, the common Jehovah's Witness from one of the anointed uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So just don't let them fool you into thinking that this is actually a Christian concept. Now, this whole idea about gaining knowledge of Jehovah, um, this is something that's really, really important that's not spoken of as often because if you go to John 17, 3, it's a verse that most Jehovah's Witnesses are going to have memorized. It says, And this, eter this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, if you speak to an older Jehovah's Witness uh, long enough, um, at some point they're going to quote uh, a portion of John 17.3, which would read in their mind that they may take in knowledge of you, the only true God. 
So to them, it's about taking in accurate knowledge. And that rendering of the New World Translation is something that they heard so often enough, they, they continue to say it even though the 2013 update of the New World Translation reads like most other modern Bibles, which says, and they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, I bring this up to just reiterate, it's about having a relationship with not only the Father, but the Son. Relationship with Father and Son, that is what Jesus Christ is speaking about here. So, having accurate knowledge is certainly important, but Jesus says this is eternal life knowing God and the Son. So Jesus didn't say this is eternal life taking inaccurate knowledge about the Father and the Son, although that is important. I'm not taking away from that. But Jesus says what he says here. It's about knowing Father and Son. So do you have a relationship with the Father and the Son? And what does having a relationship mean? So again, go back to the study article about having friendship uh, with God and what it means also to have a friendship with Jesus Christ. If you take the Watchtower's reasoning and run with it, it creates implications that a Jehovah's Witness uh, is not going to like. All right. So if you are in a study right now um, and you're going through point number one here in your answer, why is Bible study valuable? Uh, one thing you could do is bring up John 17, 3, and just to reiterate that Bible study is valuable to you because it allows you to create a deeper relationship with the Father and Jesus Christ. And you can say that John 17, 3 motivates you to do that. It'd be a great, great scripture to bring up to your study conductor when you answer uh, this question. All right, point number two, why is it important to recognize the value of Bible truth? The truths in the Bible are like precious treasures. That is why the Bible encourages us to buy truth and never sell it. When we keep in mind the value of Bible truth, we work hard to keep studying even when we face Obstacles. Okay, so we have a read here, Proverbs 2, 4, and 5. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God. Well, let's back up and look and look at some uh, context, okay? Because we're going to answer this question, why is it important to recognize the value of Bible truths? So starting in verse 1, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you to make your ear pay attention to wisdom and incline your heart to discernment or understanding, for if you call out for understanding, give your voice for discernment if you seek her as silver. And then the the verse we just read uh, continue on. So the point I want to bring up here is that wisdom and discernment means testing the words of men, rejecting them if necessary for the sake of the truth. Okay, so for answering uh, this question, why is it important to recognize the value of Bible truth, Well, because it gives you wisdom, which brings about discernment, which gives you understanding. And that's valuable because it helps you to find the truth wherever it is. And they bring out in this this article, even when we face obstacles. So you may... You may experience obstacles, but it's worth it because the truth, finding the truth is worth it. Even if it means rejecting the words of men and facing the consequences that may result from that. All right, point three, how can Jehovah help you to keep studying? 
as your almighty creator and friend, there's that friendship concept again, Jehovah wants to help you learn about him. He can help you both he can he can give you both the desire and the power to act. Okay, they have a read here Philippians 2:13. For it is God who is at work with, uh, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Now I bring this up because this scripture does not quite fit the point that's being made. Because the Watchtower has the focus here about what helps you to keep studying, and Jehovah wants you to learn about Him, and that's great. Those are fine concepts. But go to verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as, if, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And then verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So this is about living out your Christian life, working out your salvation. It's about obedience. So this passage is is not about studying. It's not about studying. So th- there's nothing wrong with these two sentences, besides the friendship part there. Yes, Jehovah wants to help you learn about him, and he can give you the desire and power to act. But that's not a good application <laughs> of Philippians 2.13. Alright, so how can Jehovah help you to uh, keep studying? So what I would suggest if I was answering this, is I would uh, go to uh, John chapter uh, 14 and just go through and find some of your favorite passages about uh, the Holy Spirit, the helper who Jesus sends uh, to guide you uh, into uh, the truth. So look at John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate or helper that he may be with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is with you and it is in you. So look at verse uh, 25. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So read all the way through John 14 through 16. What I would recommend you do is take out your favorite passages in there that talk about the Holy Spirit helping you in these certain ways, like leading you into the truth and teaching you. So how can Jehovah help you to keep studying? By giving you the Holy Spirit and guiding you through that Holy Spirit to the truth. All right, point number five. Uh, We're going to skip over point uh, last uh, two points, or point four. Uh, Point number five, persevere in the face of opposition. At times, others may try to discourage you from studying the Bible. All right, then there's a play video here. And actually, the the, the two videos that they ask you to play are pretty similar uh, stories about people who are living really, really rebellious lives. Uh, The Jehovah's Witnesses showed up, right, and then... They turned from their bad ways, and now they're one of Jehovah's Witnesses and living in accordance with that religion. Okay, that's just in a nutshell. But watch these two videos. And one thing I want you to uh, think about as you watch these two videos is the question, where is Jesus in these testimonies? Where is Jesus in these testimonies? 
Did Jesus change their lives? Did you hear anything said about Jesus in these two videos? If not, why not? So one thing that you could ask your study conductor is you could say, I noticed that none of the people in these videos spoke about Jesus being the one who changed their lives. Uh, why, do you, why do you think they didn't mention uh, Jesus Christ in these uh, videos? Just ask them and, and see what they say because we are 12 lessons into this and almost nothing has been said about Jesus Christ in these, um, in these study articles. Okay, so um, I highlighted here discouraging you from studying the Bible and then the question in this video, how did Francesco's friends and family react when he, when he told them what he was learning? So this is an example of putting the shoe on the other foot. So when you become a Jehovah's Witness and then decide to start studying the Bible with another professing Christian who is not a Jehovah's Witness, will you be discouraged from doing so? Because you'll find all sorts of testimonies, videos just like this, where someone is part of a certain religion or not, and then they start studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witness, and they get all this opposition from their friends and family, and then the Jehovah's Witnesses are encouraging them to stick with it and whatnot. But they don't ever put the shoe on the other foot. Because what happens when the faithful Jehovah's Witness starts doing that? Let's say a Jehovah's Witness gets a knock on their door from two Mormon elders, and they say, you know what? I don't really believe this Mormonism stuff, but um, I still want to hear what they have to say and go through their study lessons with them. So would that be okay to do? Well, probably not. I would think you'd be discouraged uh, from doing that as a Jehovah's Witness. So this question, how did Francisco's friends and family react when he told them what he was learning? Again, shoe on the other foot. As a Jehovah's Witness, what would happen if he started learning the Bible from a non-Jehovah's Witness? How would the Jehovah's Witnesses react? Well, what's probably going to happen is you're going to find yourself before a council of elders, a judicial committee. That's what's likely to happen. All right, point six. And this is the last point. As we draw close to Jehovah, our desire to please him increases. Still, we find it difficult to make adjustments in our life to meet his standards. Huh, to make adjustments in our lives to meet his standards. Well, what about finding salvation? Why are we talking about making adjustments in our lives in this study before we discuss salvation and what salvation means? In other words, they're putting the cart well before the horse. In fact, it's not for many studies later before you actually get into talking about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what it means. Really what you find here in these two videos is just self-helpism. It's just self-help. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to stop being in a gang and doing drugs and violence and getting out of that lifestyle. Of course that's a good thing to do. But why are we talking about cleaning up our lives before we answer the question, why are we cleaning up our lives? Is it, is it simply to please Jehovah? Well, I have a passage uh, to, to talk about there if it's, if it's about pleasing uh, Jehovah. And that is Romans chapter 3. Starting in verse 9. What then are we better? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. So that's you and me. <laughs> As it is written, this is why <laughs> we're all under sin. 
as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, unprofitable. There is none who does good, not even one. There's none who does good, not even one. What is Paul describing here? He's describing the human condition, whether you're a learned Jew or a Greek or a Gentile who don't know the way of the scriptures. It's everyone. It's universal. And if you go back to Romans uh, chapter 1, if you go back to Romans chapter 1 in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Okay, so it's the universal human condition. We None of us can do good, not even one. None of us can please God. I bring that up. Because in this testimony about this, uh, this biker gentleman, I can't remember his name, this is a quote from him. He said, Jehovah has seen something in me, and he's brought it to light that I am a good person. I can be a good human being. I can help other people. I can be loved by him. So yes, you can be loved by him, but do you become loved by him by being a good person? Did it take you cleaning up your life? Did it take you cleaning up your life for Jehovah to then start loving you? Is that what it took? So again, nothing in here in this testimony about Jesus Christ. But look at what we just read in Romans chapter 3 and just compare it to what this gentleman said. Now let's go to Romans chapter 4 and see what it says about good works and salvation. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, that means to pronounce righteous by works, he has something to boast about. So if you're pronounced righteous by your works, by doing good, you have something to boast about because great, give yourself a round of applause. Right? That's basically what it's saying here. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So in other words, Abraham didn't have the good works to boast about. Instead, he believed God. He trusted in God. That is what gave him righteousness, not his good works. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wage is not counted according to grace. In other words, it's not counted by what you don't deserve, which is grace, but according to what is due. So if you work 
you get what is due to you. You get a, if you work, you get a paycheck, right? But look at this in verse five. But to the one who does not work, but instead believes upon him who justifies or declares righteous the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. Read verse 5 over and over and over again to yourself until this sinks in. Actually, read verses 1 through 5. Read them over and over again. And then go back and watch both of these testimonies, especially the second one. The one titled, Jehovah Helps Us to Make Changes. Then go to verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Apart from works. Apart from cleaning up your life. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Wow, what an amazing, amazing passage. It's not about works. It's not about doing the works to become accepted by God. So let's look at these two questions here. What will Jehovah do for those earnestly seeking him? That is, those who try hard to get to know and please him. Now, this only makes sense in the context of someone who has been saved, who's been declared righteous apart from works. Because, what again, what is the universal human condition? There is no one who seeks after God. There is no one who does good, not even one. It's recognizing your condition. And there's nothing you can do to change your condition. But what can happen is that God can declare you righteous. He can give you a righteousness. And that righteousness is not yours. It's the one that Jesus Christ earned in credits to your account so that you have the righteousness of Christ. So if you want to talk about pleasing God, it's only in that context of being forgiven, your sins covered, being justified, and declared righteous. Second question, how, what does this tell you about how Jehovah feels when he sees your efforts to study the Bible? Our efforts mean nothing until we found salvation in Jesus Christ. So the question you could ask your study conductor is how can salvation be obtained? Because I don't think Jehovah is going to feel anything good about my efforts in studying the Bible until I'm made right with him. How am I made right with Jehovah? And where does Jesus fit into the picture there? Good questions to ask your study conductor. So if you want to go back to what motivates you uh, to study the Bible, it would be these things that we're reading about right here. Learning about truths like he justifies the ungodly. Romans 4, 5. Learning about things like that. I mean, what, what greater truth is there than knowing that you can be made right with God apart from your good works? So we're going to wrap it up there. And this ends section one. A lot of interesting points, but also a lot of very mundane and basic points. But if you've never had any exposure to the Bible or Christianity, maybe some of this is uh, beneficial to you, some of these basic points. But if you've had familiarity with the Bible, a lot of these are just super basic, maybe dull, and probably mundane. And that's one of the problems with this publication is that everybody basically starts in the first lesson, no matter how versed you are in the scriptures. Everyone starts in lesson one. But now that we get to section two, 
Now we get to some very, very interesting topics. In the next one, we're going to look at in Lesson 13, how false religion misrepresents God. We are going to start to get into the nitty gritty of Bible doctrine and true religion and false religion. So I'm really looking forward to this study. And I will tell you, uh, one of my favorite uh, studies that uh, we're going to get to, it's going to take a little while to get there, is uh, the baptism lesson. That one, when I went through these studies uh, with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, the baptism one was a pivotal moment. Pivotal moment, unlike any of the other ones we had discussed. Also, the why do evil and suffering exist. Um, I actually just went through that one uh, last week uh, with two Jehovah's Witnesses. And how, how can Jesus' death save us? Wow, yeah, um, a lot to get into. What is God's kingdom? God's kingdom now rules. That's where you'll get into uh, 1914. So there's definitely some very meaty, theologically meaty uh, topics that you will definitely get into if you can last all the way up to uh, these points. And I think you can really make some inroads on uh, some of these topics like I believe that I made um, when we went through especially um, uh, the baptism. So I cannot wait to get into that. So I hope these uh, reviews of these study lessons have been helpful to you. For those of you who have told me um, in the comments and whatnot that these lessons have been helpful to you because you're going through a study right now, thank you for letting me know that. Um, if you haven't let me know that, um, please let me know that. That way I know that I should continue doing um, uh, these enjoy life forever uh, reviews. So if you found them to be helpful, please let me know, and that will just encourage me to continue doing these. Um, I'll definitely get back to the Watchtower study reviews um, when there comes one that is uh, interesting enough uh, to take the place of one of these enjoy life forever reviews. So um, that's all for today. Um, I should have a review next week. So see you then.